This is the second part of our two-parter from Unleash America, again recorded last week on Wednesday and Thursday. In the first episode, we heard from Ali Naurat, Matt Alder and Caroline Bierlich. On this episode, you can hear from Jana Moran, the CEO and co-founder of Speakfully, Raluca Apostol, the CPO and co-founder of Nesta, and Wendy Daly, talent acquisition strategist at Sanford Health. Again, this is a snapshot into what's going on in the HR tech and talent market in North America. This is your weekly technology podcast brought to you by Nash Squared and hosted by myself, David Savage. So I'm chatting to Jana from Speakfully, co-founder, CEO. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Where have you come from to be at Unleash? Uh, I came up from Wisconsin, so Midwest. Yes. 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 My American geography is useless, so people are saying <laughs> places okay. to me, and I'm like, yeah, Mine is too, and I live here, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So first of all, for anything else, who's Speakfully? Speakfully. Uh, so Speakfully is a modern day, new generation, anonymous workplace reporting platform mm-hmm. that we like to say that employees will actually use. So if you think about a traditional uh, reporting hotline that still exists today is uh, very archaic mm-hmm. um, and a lot of people don't use it for lots of different reasons. So we like to say that we solve for the reasons why people don't use those traditional reporting hotlines. What are those reasons? I mean, yeah. archaic is one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, archaic kind of goes along with the same lines as, you know, the interface mm-hmm. and, and the, the flow of using it um, isn't necessarily, it's very sterile, right? Um, so we, we try to, to make it not like, our platform not like that, make it very user-friendly, very easy to use. Um, outside of that, you know, if you think about a... Um, you know, from an organization standpoint, they don't like necessarily anonymous reports generally because they don't get enough information to be able to take action a lot of the times. And then they have no way to communicate back and forth with that employee to be able to get more information. Um, and so we are solving for that. But then also from an employee perspective, generally when they're reporting anonymously, they're doing that for a reason. Mm-hmm. They don't feel comfortable. Um, for there could be lots of different reasons. Um, it's all very subjective to that person, but we want to still be able to give them the ability to do that uh, so that they report. It's either reporting or not reporting. We don't want to impact them not to report because we don't allow them to do it anonymously. So we're giving them still the ability to anonymously uh, report to the organization, but giving the organization and the employee the ability to communicate back and forth to be able to get more information, to take action. So that's one of one other uh, ways that we're solving from like a traditional reporting hotline. Another thing is if you think about a traditional hotline, employees are uh, submitting it to someone, kind of goes into a black hole. There's no transparency really there, no accountability. Yep. Um, and that kind of almost creates this toxic environment between the employees and the organization because they look at it and say, well, they're not doing anything. Why do I even try to report? Um, and reality the organization might be doing something uh but they don't know about it and then maybe the organization doesn't have enough information to take action yeah so then it looks like they're not doing anything it's kind of just a one-way communication from employee to org and then that's it um and so they just kind of goes in a black hole to the employee side of things sometimes and then they feel like nothing's being done when in reality there could be just out of interest you mentioned about the interface in terms of integrating into people's working lives you know if I think about our business, we've got Teams, we've got Yammer, we've got an intranet. Mm-hmm. I very rarely remember to look at things like mm-hmm. Yammer and the intranet. Yeah. Live in Teams. Mm-hmm. So is, right. it, is there an element of you've got to get it into the workflow of people so that, yeah, all right, they might have an issue that they want to report, but they even remember that it's there. That it's there. Exactly. That's a really good point. Uh, we do a lot of things from our side of things to remind the organization uh, to also remind the employees that it exists, right? But we do that in a couple of different ways because if you think about it, uh, the day of hire, you find out about some of these things, and mm. specifically a reporting, whatever reporting mechanism it might be. So even if it was a traditional hotline, you hear about it, but then at that time, you don't need it. <laughs> Nothing's happening where you need to report anything. So you don't really think about it much when the first day of hire, when they tell you about it, but then it doesn't really get talked about after that. So then when something is does happen, you might not even know that there's something there that exists. So what we do on our side of that 
is we do provide the organization some analytics uh, so that they can kind of figure out where the hotspots are, but also know what conversations to continuously have with employees about what's going on so that they can be reminded about the platform itself. And so that is a huge part of that is the organization's duty, right, to ensure and make sure that throughout time they post up, they post things up, uh, they make sure that they remind their employees that, this, that these things are there. Um, but we give them some data and analytics to kind of help them mm. and guide them on what types of conversations that they should be having um, so that, you know, Speakly will come up um, it, when they're having those conversations. So look, from a, from a personal perspective, mm -hmm. what led you to being the CEO and co-founder of an organization trying to fix this particular problem? Yeah. Uh, so... Unfortunately, I mean, a lot of a lot of, a lot of uh, these startups come up from a personal experience of their own, and I'm in I'm no different. Uh, I had a personal experience where I was uh, harassed by my superior for a good span of over a year, and left the organization because of it. After I left there, I reflected a lot on what I wish I would have had as an employee going through that during that time but also what I wish the organization would have done differently in order for me to come forward sooner than what I did. I think a lot of the times when organizations are thinking about, you know, um, trying to get out or not hire these certain types of personalities, you don't purposely hire someone knowing that they're going to, you know, mis be mistreating other people. Um, and we're never going to be able to personally change the way that people treat other people. Yes, you could have some impact, you could have some influence, but people are going to be the way that they're going to be. And But what we can do is we can educate the employees and what they need to do and what they should look for in order to know what when they should come forward. And that needs to be through the encouragement of the organization and, and educating their employees so that they can come forward sooner, mm -hmm. so that they can get those people out versus not coming forward or kind of sitting on it because they're unsure of what types of things to look for when they should be reporting these things. And then it gets to a point where it's too late and then they end up leaving the organization because of it. So it's more about educating the employees to get these people out sooner and getting the employees to come forward sooner versus thinking about trying to, to mitigate people from doing it, period. As, yes, there can be helpful uh, scenarios where you could... Um, you know, train people on what you should and shouldn't do and how you should be a good human and how you shouldn't be a good human. Yeah. But, you know, you also, but more importantly, like, let's tell the people that are actually experiencing those things. So lots of times the people that are doing it don't even think they're doing anything wrong. So even when you're training them, they still don't think that they're those people, <laughs> you know? So it's interesting. It's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, I don't know what the statistics are and hopefully mm -hmm. I wouldn't be shocked, but fingers crossed the majority of people aren't put in a situation where they are harassed. But do you know, have you ever, ever looked at kind of the data or, or kind of any feedback as to how important or, or how positive it is for an organization to have something like this in place, even if someone doesn't need to use it, the mere fact that they know that that exists. Like yeah, we don't have stats on it yet. I think that platforms like this are, you know, the data is starting to come out there. There's not enough of it yet. But what I think is interesting is we like to say that we're, to your point, we are like a benefit for the employee, just like medical and dental insurance is, right? They don't always need it, but when they do have it, they're happy that they have it so that they can, you know, do something with that. So, yeah, it's not necessarily like people are going to be in it all the time, but you're, to your point, a lot of, especially in the environment that we're living in now and the type of workforce that's out there, people are looking for these types of tools in environments before they even uh, accept a job offer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you think about the Me Too, in the last few years, we have the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, everyone, the pandemic hit, everyone's working remote. You have the Great Resignation, and not all those are directly in, are directly uh, workplace related, but it all bleeds into it in yeah. some capacity. Mm -hmm. And so now, and it's not going to be the last thing either. There's going to be something else that's going to come. And so I think organizations are now knowing that this is a now a, a need to have versus a nice to have. Whereas it used to be the opposite and it used to be a type of thing that gets taken out, out of the budget, you know, at the end of the year when they're looking for things to take out of the budget. So I do think that it's starting to shift in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the data is still coming out about it. And it, again, I also think it's the organization's duty to ensure that they are continuously reminding their employees that these types of things are there as 
as an employee not experiencing anything at the moment, when they're telling you about it, you hear it, but you're not fully hearing it. Mm -hmm. But when you actually are experiencing something from personal experience and you would hear something in the moment, it's just kind of like a, you know, if you, if you think about like a cold email that you receive or that you receive, most of the time you're deleting it. But sometimes there is that one that comes through in that moment where you are experiencing or dealing with something right then and there. They're like, oh, that's very relevant to what I just had a conversation about that we need to implement or that we need to do. Yep. And then you actually look at it and listen to it. And so it's the same type of mentality of when you're actually experiencing something, that that's something where you're going to you know, retain it more. Look, this, this conference is all about HR, HR tech, mm -hmm. talent, people. What, you know, just talking to people around the conference, mm -hmm. maybe kind of you know, in conversations with people kind of before and after the event yesterday. Mm -hmm. What do you think the big themes are coming out of this year's conference? Oh, man. Um, I don't... The, the, I mean, personally, I've been sitting at our booth <laughs> the whole time. Diligence. I haven't even gone to any sessions because I've been sitting at our booth talking to customers um, or potential customers. Uh, so I don't have, like, the themes of what's coming out of any of the sessions, per se. Yeah. Um, I do think one thing that's come out of it is I think everyone's really excited to be back in person. Yeah, no, I agree. No, that's face true. Face. No, no, you, you um, kind of, yeah. let's not downplay that. Yeah. That matters. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's been awesome and, and super fun to be yeah, able yeah. to like, just even sit down and have this conversation with you uh, is something that up until this point in the last couple of years, it's all been over Zoom, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just even getting in front of people and having those conversations, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. You know, um, so. So if someone wanted, wanted to explore Speakfully um, to a greater degree, how would they do that? Yeah, they go to www.speakfully.com mm -hmm. um, or they could um, email me if they would like. Um, you can email me at Jana at speakfully.com. Happy to answer any questions. Obviously, we're in the States at the moment. You yes, are a US business, but if they are not... Yes. A US company? Still email me. We do cool. have we do have people who are uh, using our platform not in the US, so we're all over the place. Thank you for your time. Yes, awesome, thank you. So I'm chatting to Reluca, CPO of Nesta, on the second day of Unleash. Just around the back of the stage, the booth where you are exhibiting. How's the conference going? Ah, oh, it's great. It's great to be here. Um, a lot of people, a lot of meaningful connections. I'm really great. I'm really happy to be here. And where have you come from? So we are coming flying from San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's really nice to be in Vegas and enjoy uh, also um, all the activities in here and connected with meaningful people, HR leaders, directors, and yeah, not only. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for the for the invite. And quite clearly from your accent, you're you're European. Yeah, I'm so. European. Originally, originally, I'm from Romania. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really I'm really happy to be here and be a Romanian. <laughs> In amongst all of the craziness of Vegas. And, yeah, uh, yeah, craziness so of Vegas. Tell us a little bit about Nesta and who they are. Yeah. So uh, Nesta is the people intelligence platform that helps organizations <laughs> engage, develop, and retain talent. Uh, what we do at Nestor is we bring together employee engagement, performance management, and development planning. But what we do differently is through a skills-based approach. Uh, actually, we link skills in every process the organization runs, and we collect data from goals and goal KRs, from surveys, from feedback, from one-on-one um, -on -one conversations between the managers and the employee, and we build a skills profile in our app for each employee. And we start from an initial profile and while, while you are working with the platform, you evolve the skills over time. So that based on your interest as an employee and based on the, the desired skills that the organization has, we um, help the employee to, with those opportunities that they need in order to develop. Like maybe if I want to develop one of my skills, then um, I would receive from uh, from Nestor a recommendation uh, that you may take a course or, or you may, I don't know, practice something or you may uh, participate in a project. So it's about how we bring the best opportunity to the best, to, to, to the right people at the right time. So yeah, this is Nestor. How do you make sure that companies get users to really interact 
with the the platform because did you say it was an app does it does it integrate with existing kind of so um it's a web-based application yeah. it's not an app on the phone of right. course we uh we can uh, we can access the uh, nestor from from our phones as well because yeah. uh, it's really responsive um how we get sure that we make sure that people is using nestor mm. this is your question yeah i suppose because it's there's so many there's so many tools out yeah. there you kind of walk yeah. around this floor yeah. And it's trying to work out yeah. how you get the, the time in front of users because you know there's there's so many different tooling that people can bring into their workflow for employees. Trying to get time yeah. and make sure that there is real engagement must be yeah. it must be a challenge, especially as a CPO. Yes, it, it is a challenge. When we started Nestor, we thought about what is the main benefit for the employee to use Nestor, and for us at Nestor, the employee is the main stakeholder. If people are using Nestor, then the data is collected and we can bring those opportunities um, to them back. So it's about how we give back to people. It's about ownership on their own uh, own development. It's about how they can be feel meaningful at work and being connected to the company's mission. So we bring a lot of transparency in the organization. And at the same time, while I'm connected to the company's vision and I have the autonomy to grow, then I feel meaningful at work. So this is why people are, are using Nestor, because they have the autonomy they need and they can interact and bring those initiatives in the company so that they feel meaningful. This, so, sorry, this this focus on skills yeah, and the, on skills. the skills that the organizations are now looking for, is it changing the way that people's careers are constructed? Because we used yeah. to think of, you know, you join a particular department and there's a linear right. kind of ladder that you climb. But skills now, it would seem that, that it's far more fluid and people can float around organizations and, and maybe organizations need that flexibility. But I suppose it's harder for a traditional HR team to know exactly how to manage everyone's career development if, if the path isn't quite as clearly set as it used to be. Yeah, so our vision at Nestor is that... Um, there will not be those sta static job roles with the skills required. So we connect skills to the individual. I have some skills. I have some skills that I need in order to perform in my job. Yep. I had some have some skills that I may be acquired them like in other job roles or in other companies and I have some desired skills. So the way we do this um, at Nestor is that while you have all this data, then you can uh, have those opportunities for you to develop and you can make lateral moves. Yeah. Um, so in our vision at Nestor is that skills will define job roles mm. and not job roles will define skills. And there will be like these projects and you need some skills in that project. So you don't actually need roles. You need some activities that have been done, that must be done. And at the same time, you need the right people to work too. So um, having this uh, skills-based organization, um, and this is a trend now, everyone is talking about skills, skills management, how we collect them, how we build a common language for skills at work. So here Nestor comes in and creates this, this balance, how we think about skills and how we join projects based on our skills and not not based on the job roles defined. So you, you've been at your booth, obviously that's your focus and yeah. I, I don't imagine you've had as much opportunity to go to talks and, and, and whatnot as you might might otherwise. But what are you hearing kind of what from kind of snippets of conversation you might be overhearing? What what do people seem to be talking about here that's, yeah. that's kind of um, coming to the fore? People are talking a lot a lot about how they can uh, switch to a skills-based, um, I don't know, assessment and how they can collect skills, how they can leverage uh, the skills so that uh, they can bring the right opportunities to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I've heard a lot about data-driven HR, yeah. so people analytics and everything with regards to data, how we can integrate all the systems so that um, you can make better decisions faster. So this one, these are the topics that are really in, 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 in a very high trend today, uh, but at the same time, automation. So how we can automate those tasks or those uh, workflows so that we can 
be focused on on the creative part, yeah. on the decision making part, on the I don't know, identify new opportunities. So yeah, this is what I've seen yeah. so far, and um, I think um, there are a lot of people that share great experiences and learnings, and it, it's a very nice place to be uh, to be and to to connect with people and learn a lot. I really appreciate your time at short notice because if anyone's listening I literally kind of said hey let's talk about kind of half an hour ago so I appreciate you giving up some time but, <laughs> thank um, you so much for inviting me if anyone wanted to find out more about Nesta how would they do it? so um, you can always uh, um, come to our website it's nestorup.com nestorup.com um, either connect it with me on LinkedIn it's Roluca Ipostol I'm the chief product officer at Nestor I would be happy to be connected and yeah we can start a conversation there Thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you so much. So I'm chatting to Wendy. Wendy, you're a talent acquisition specialist? Strategist. Strategist. Strategist, At yes. Sanford Health. Yes, I am. What is, what is a talent acquisition strategist <laughs> as opposed to a specialist? Uh, so I work on the workforce planning side mm -hmm. of talent acquisition and look for new and different ways to build our talent pipelines, mm -hmm. figure out where do we need to look next, where do we need to go next, and also look at what tools should we be using? Where should, what should we, who should we be working with to create that, those pipelines to be able to bring people to us um, and to go out and find them? Yeah. Because right now... Nobody's coming. <laughs> I shouldn't say nobody, but it's harder because we, even as a healthcare organization, you don't just compete with other healthcare organizations because you have uh, housekeepers, you have food service workers, you have accountants. And so you are competing with everybody. Yeah. And now we are competing around the world because our people can work anywhere. That's an interesting point yeah. because... You're an organization, you're certainly over 10,000 employees? Uh, we're right, uh, right under 50,000 employees right, right so now. Right, yeah. so big. We're big. Yeah, I think LinkedIn yeah. then is, is underestimating the size of the organization. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Where are the predominantly they based? Because you're South Dakota. South Dakota, yep. Um, right. So mostly North and South Dakota, Minnesota is our major footprint. Yep. Um, however, we have uh, long-term care facilities in 26 states. So we are from Florida to Hawaii. Um, some just have one facility, some have multiple, um, but with the remote options changing, a lot of like our corporate work can be done anywhere, Yeah. Um, which in the States is challenging sometimes because each state has its own rules. Yeah. So we have to be careful about which states are we recruiting in, which states will we allow people to work and which states will they, um, do we want to like start, start that process <laughs> on the HR tech stage yesterday uh, I sat through a talk with a um, I think it was uh, Noom was talking about mm -hmm. the ability to look at a map of where technology skills are prevalent and then look oh, at a map wow. of where your competition lies mm -hmm. and then going all right look you know we might know that there are there are a certain amount of engineers yeah. here or white collar workers here but the competition's really high whereas actually this state's got fewer but less mm -hmm. competition is, is that are those the kind of decisions you're trying to go through at the minute where yeah. where actually there is this much wider net mm -hmm. that you can cast yeah so we're trying to find like heat maps essentially of yeah. where where are those crossovers and so we are actually we're partnering with some online schools and building pipelines with them to create internships with their, their students to go to work at our facilities. And so looking at those heat maps of where are the students and where are our facilities and are they within driving distance if it's an in-person um, position? Yeah. Um, are they, is it something that could be done remotely? Um, so having, having those conversations and thinking about how we do it differently. Um, and two, you know, where... You know, let's pick on nurses because they're easy to pick on right now. So where are there schools that are outputting more or, or will be outputting more nurses than there'll be positions for in their area? And could we get them to relocate to, to come work for us? So I suppose fundamentally, the pandemic hasn't changed the dynamic that you've got there because they have to be able to drive to those facilities. But yeah. tools may have been developed as a consequence of other challenges that companies are right. facing that are now useful. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of corporate work being able to go remote. 
And um, so what, one of the things that we're trying to look at as well is can we move more of those jobs away from our main headquarters where jobs have to be in person? Bedside nurse can't do that anywhere else. You know, there's some jobs you have to be there to do. So re looking at some of those jobs, looking at more and more jobs and saying, what has to be done in person? What can be done elsewhere? Can we mix it up a little bit? Can we look at that differently? Because there aren't enough people in the Dakotas. There aren't enough people in our major footprint to be able to fill all of the jobs that we have available. So we have to start thinking about that differently. And like we were talking about those heat maps, figuring out where are people and where can we where can we go find them and how can we bring them into us? Yeah. Now you are here um, as, a, as an attendee rather than an exhibitor. I've spoken yes. to a few people who are tied to stands and therefore yeah. I suppose their exposure to what's going on is a bit limited. Yeah. I had the opportunity to talk to a couple of the journalists from Unleashed to see what they're seeing. Okay. But from the, from the talks that you've yeah. sat through, what do you think is interesting that's coming out of the conference? Uh, I think we're seeing a huge push to be employee centric. Yeah. And people have been talking that for a long time. There's been a, a lot of lip service to that for years and years. But I think now, especially in the States, there's a push for unionization. I mean, Starbucks is unionizing, Amazon is unionizing. And so um, one of the speakers yesterday made this comment and it stuck with me is like, you, sh you need to provide a work environment that your employees don't need to be protected from you. So how can you create an environment? What can you do? And there's no best practice. I think that's a term that needs to just be gone. You need to figure out what do your employees need and how can you as an employer provide that to them? And that's what I've seen in so many of these talks. They're all kind of coming back to that. We need to be more employee centric. We need to bring, get them what they need and not just in what in terms of what can it do for our organization, but what can it also do for them in terms of their individual lives and their individual career path, whether it's with us or with someone else. Yeah. Because even if they only stay with us for two years, that's two years we don't, one, we don't have to recruit somebody else. <laughs> and it's two years that we get out of them and can make them part of who our organization, who we want our organization to be. Well, look, it's been lovely to chat to you. Yeah. I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. First yes. first conference in three years? Uh, three, yeah. No, it was October 2019 was wow. my last conference. So this has been great. Unleashed has been, this is a wonderful conference. Yeah. Lots of great speakers. I'm very thankful to Hewler for inviting me to come along with them and get to be an attendee and go out and listen and, and talk with folks. It's It's nice. It is nice to be back in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, enjoy the trip home. Uh, you too. Thank you.